Hello and welcome. I'm Lorna Virgili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government, and we're in front of a live audience. Are you guys live? Yes. yes. <laughs> and we are physically located at the Wheaton, at the brand new Wheaton Recreation and Library Complex, of course, in Wheaton. And in just a few minutes, you will hear from Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge about the fiscal year 2021 operating budget. This is an opportunity for county residents to ask questions and make remarks and converse with the county executive. This is the first of five of these budget forums. And tonight, for the benefit of you at home and also the live audience, let me go over the agenda. First, we will have some welcome introductions by Luisa Montero Diaz, who is the director of the Mid-County Regional Services Center, followed by remarks from Luis Monsano. Did I pronounce it right? Yes, you did. All righty, the chair of the Mid-County Citizens Advisory Board. And subsequent to that, we will have a presentation by the Office of Management and Budget on the process and also on the current fiscal climate. After all of that, our County Executive Mark Elridge will have some remarks and then you, present here, thank you for being here tonight, will have an opportunity to ask questions directly to the county executive. So before all of that, I'm gonna to toss to you, Lisa, and it's all yours. Thank you, Lorna. Buenas noches, good evening. Good evening to all of you, and thanks for being here. Um, As Lorna said, my name is Luisa Montero Diaz, the director of the Mid-County Regional Service Area Office, um, and I'm happy to welcome you to the first of five uh, forums this year at a different time of the year. Uh, this is the Mid-County Regional uh, Budget Forum for the FY21 operating budget. Um, as the county's representative in this community, in this region, uh, Mid-County, part of my job is to keep people as connected as possible to what's going on in the county. And then there's a couple of ways that you can help me do that better. Uh, one is to sign up for the e-newsletter, and as you came in, you saw that you could sign up there. Um, this, you'll get it weekly, and it'll tell you a bit about things like this and other activities of interest to you in the, uh, the Mid-County area. And then also you can attend, there are two advisory uh, boards that meet on a monthly basis and they're open meetings. And it's a pleasure to have tonight some of the members from these two advisory boards. There's the Mid-County Citizens Advisory Board and the Wheaton Urban District Advisory Committee. So if you all could just stand so people can see that you're here and if you have questions about what they do and how they can help you with your concerns, please feel free to, uh, to approach them. Um, Bill Jellin, by the way, is the chair of the Wheaton Urban District Advisory Committee, and Louis Mozano, who you're going to hear from in a second, is the chair of the Mid-County Citizens Advisory Board. Um, also in the room tonight, there are various uh, representatives from county agencies. I won't ask them all to stand up, but um, they're around Department of Transportation and General Services and Recreation and also libraries and a number of other folks. So please, um, if you're hanging around, just ask who is the person who's head of the libraries and you can be directed to them if you have questions for them specifically. And then we also have, I know, Council Member Albernaz, uh, Joy Normie is here, as well as uh, Council Vice President Sydney Katz, um, representative. Yeah, Lisa, <laughs> sorry, didn't see that. So um, now I'm going to uh, do, well, do one quick more thing, and that's really, really, really to thank the, uh, the staff here at the Wheaton Library uh, Recreation Center. They've been fantastic, and I just want to thank uh, Alicia Scotto, who is director of the rec center here, and David. He's the regional area director. Um, and then Rob and Riley's here, and they're just always so helpful, and they've been a fantastic host tonight, so thank you. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce Luis Mozano, the chair of the Mid-County Citizens Advisory Board, who will make a few remarks. And then after him, Corey Orleski will come up from the Office of Management and Budget to talk to you a little bit about the FY21 budget process uh, with the PowerPoint presentation. So again, thanks for being here. Uh, hi, as it was said, I'm Louis Mozzano. Um, I am the chair of the Mid-County Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, it's my third year on the board, but my second year as the chair, and it's been my honor to do a few introductions for this. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome everybody here. I think this is a great opportunity 
to hear from the county as well as to hear from the residents about what's going on um, and the fact that it is televised here in Wheaton I think is fantastic. Um, like they said, this is the first of five. Uh, we plan to address a variety of issues and I do hope that all of you have a lot of questions because uh, I think it's very important to the county to hear from the residents most importantly and that is why we have these. Um, um, that is it for me, it's very brief, but I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Corey Olofs Orlowski from the Office of Management and Budget. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Corey Woloski. I represent the Office of Management and Budget with the Montgomery County Government. Uh, today's presentation, purpose, why are we here? Uh, I want to give you a little bit of context about the operating budget itself, and really we want to get feedback from the residents. We need an opportunity for the residents to express their views and their priorities on the county government so that the executive can hear this information and as the county goes through the process of determining the FY21 budget, all of the priorities from the entire county are heard and considered. Next slide here represents the seven priority outcomes of the county executive. These are guiding principles to serve the county. Each priority outcome has three key indicators which are used to measure success towards achieving the results we look for with each of those priority outcomes. Montgomery County government has two budgets. One of them is an ongoing long-term capital budgets process. The other one is the operating budget that has the services in mind. The services are those that we see every day. They're the fire officer, the fire department in the back of the room. They are the rec facilities, the libraries employees that ser serve this building. The capital budget, this brand new building is an example of a capital budget project. Uh, that is a project that started in 2013 and just recently finished that is to a tune of $71 million. And at this point, I'm actually going to do a little something different, and the county executive, Mark L, is just going to come up and take care of the next few slides. We haven't, rehearsed, we haven't rehearsed this yet. This is our first uh, run through like this. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that's different about uh, the budget this year is we normally ask for citizen input after the budget is done. Um, so last year we did a set of meetings, but budgets had already been submitted by departments. When I got there in December, most of the work had been done by departments. And <clears throat> we spent most of the spring cutting budgets because revenues were not equal to what had been assumed in the budget, so we had to make adjustments. So we thought, hey, we'll do these meetings earlier and uh, give people a chance to give us some feedback before we actually create the budget. Uh, that doesn't mean that we get to do everything because lots of the budget is largely set. The school budget, which is half of what we're gonna spend, uh, is determined by formula and the, count, the council doesn't change that. We can't decrease spending, we can only increase it. We can't direct spending to any particular thing in the school system. So basically we put forward a budget that's pretty predictable. And if you think about what you get in county services, this rec center will be here next year. So the budget will account for this rec center. It'll account for the fire folks in the white shirts at the back of the room and everybody who goes out there. So there's a lot of the budget that's predictable year to year, but where we have opportunities to look at what we're doing, ask ourselves, is what we're doing right? Is it working? Is it effective? And also to hear from people about, do you have different priorities? Um, do you have ideas that might give us insights on how to change a little bit of how we spend so it delivers things that are more important to you? Um, you'll have the chance to, to speak and we'll be doing this all over the county. And then we'll be weighing those kind of discussions as well as giving council members an opportunity to talk to us about what they want to see in the budget before the budget actually gets sealed. We want to have as much input on the front end so that the constructing of the budget goes forward and everybody feels like they were heard and you may not always get everything you want, but at least you know you had a chance to help us think about how to do this. <clears throat> so I want to talk about the first slide because these are basically... Um, the seven big priorities, and I'm going to just give you a rough idea about why they are. Uh, the first one is the Early Childhood Initiative. We 
are trying to get as many children as we possibly can through early childhood education before they hit public schools. Right now, about half the kids who hit public, school, public schools are considered to be two years behind. Um, the idea of being five years old and two years behind um, is pretty daunting. And what it means is just a lack of language acquisition, and basic background knowledge and vocabulary, all of which are things that profoundly affect your ability to understand what you read and what you hear. And so the idea of f focusing on early childhood education is making sure that to the, to the best of our abilities, we can bring students up to a level where they enter kindergarten basically with similar language skills and, and at least some similar background knowledge so we're, everybody is working off the same set of tools and is more likely to be successful in places that are good at early ch childhood education, discover that you do less remediation later on. And if I were gonna show you a graph of return on investment, this affected me when I first got on the council. Um, there's a graph and starting up here um, was investment in, in a one or two year old. And the rate of return was like eight to one. And then the graph, the graph plummets and then levels out. And by the time you get to an eight year old, the rate of return on investment was one to one. Um, so the dollars you put in up front make an enormous difference in a child's outcome. The dollars you put at the end, much less so. So we're going to try to focus over the next few years more and more dollars into the front end. And one of the tasks we have for this year, while we're waiting to go into the next budget, is locating spaces and locating staff that can help fund the next spurt of growth in early childhood facilities. Next, next priority for us is affordable housing. Um, you've heard everybody talk about the lack of affordable housing. It is really profound for people whose incomes are $30,000 or less. There are about 22,000 households who cannot find housing in that price range. In contrast, if you are somebody making 55 to 80,000, typically thought of as people who are candidates for MPDUs, there are actually more MPDUs than there are people in that income bracket. However, there's a ton of people who don't make enough money, who don't make enough money and can't find an expensive housing who are living in housing that's priced in this bracket. And that's why they're spending 50 and 60% of their income for housing, because they can find housing that's affordable to somebody at 60% of the median income. They can't find housing for people at 30%. So we want to start trying to crack that nut. Um, I have a commitment to developing a no net loss of affordable housing. I do not want to do developments where we tear down existing affordable housing, where people who are below 60% of very median income are living, and then build only MPDUs to replace them which means that if you were on the lower end of the scale living in some of these apartments, you actually don't get to come back to the bright new apartment. And there's no place else for these folks to go in Montgomery County. So any kind of affecting, effective affordable housing policy has to deal with people at the bottom, not just people in the middle. And so we're gonna to try to craft a policy that works that way. We are working and bringing in um, more people to look at county property. We are beginning, we've actually, put our first piece of county property on the block, so to speak, to get proposals for building affordable housing on it. And people know what we're looking for in affordable housing, and we're hopefully gonna get proposals that start to match what we've been looking for. One bright sign in all this is that a previously approved development came back and asked to modify their programming. And I was used to what it normally happens when people come back and wanna modify their programming. And I will say I was, shocked because they took the MPDUs from 40 to 62. They increased the number of three bedroom apartments, which are important if you want to house families in some of this. And they wanted to know if I was okay with that. And as yeah, I was okay with that. Um, I want to see more of that. And I think, and I hope that our expectations for better performance will lead to people competing to provide deals that offer us better performance. I believe we can do better. I just think we need to tell people what it is we need and stand by that. Um, we are beginning work on our rapid transit initiatives or continuing work. 
We will open up um, service on Route 29. I am not letting them call that BRT because the traffic from uh, the shopping center in White Oak South uh, will be in mixed, the buses will be in mixed traffic. And if it's running in mixed traffic and it's in congestion, it is not rapid transit. It may be better service and above New Hampshire Avenue will be better service, but it's not gonna be what I want. When we get back and we're looking at a, at a further change to allow a reversible lane down the middle, then you can call it bus rapid transit. Meanwhile, we're working for on proposals on Veers Mill Road and we're working on a major proposal on 355, which would connect people from Clarksburg all the way down to Bethesda to try to unload some of the traffic that's on the roads up there. So those are big priorities for me. Uh, you may have noticed the governor had a plan. Uh, we're trying to persuade him to do something more sensible and more cost effective. Use the ICC to divert traffic across to the west side of the county. Put two reversible lanes down the middle of I-270, which there's plenty of room to do. And that would get them the two lanes they need at the time of day they need them. Think about it. Any of you have experienced 270, there's no rush hour going north in 270 in the morning, but there's a hell of a rush hour going south. And in the evening, it's reverse. So we're trying to convince the governor, do what's sensible, do the two reversible lanes, let the ICC do what it was meant to do, which is get people to 270 and onto express lanes that are taken to the bridge in Virginia. And we're gonna to continue to work what I think is a sensible solution to the problem. So if the governor says we're sticking our heads in the sand that we're not in favor of traffic solutions, we're very much in favor of solutions, but we want good solutions. And we want, don't want to spend $10 billion on a solution which may leave things no better than they are today. And I'm not interested in going into people's neighborhoods and taking housing away. So we're, we're going to stick tight to that. Uh, we have very ambitious goals for climate change. I know some people are impatient. It is, uh, it's hard to figure out what exactly you do when. Uh, some people wanted us to spend $800,000 on a consultant. I didn't think that was a very good idea because consultants had done reports for Boston, Seattle, and New York. All of us have the three same major components of greenhouse gases. It's residential housing, commercial buildings, and transportation. Same in Boston, same in Washington, same in Seattle. So we're going to take that work and we're going to look at the best ideas that came out of it. But we put out a call for volunteers. We got 125 volunteers or more, 125 was the last number I heard, to serve on five committees. One committee is working on residential buildings and what we can do. Another is looking at the commercial building sector. A third is looking at transportation. A fourth is looking at agriculture and sequestering carbon. And the fifth is actually looking at public relations because if we're gonna win this, we need people engaged. We've got to convince people that not only is this important, but if we don't act, we will never be able to fix this. And I was, you know, there was a poll you may have read in the Washington Post about two weeks ago. The good news was that 61% of the pe people think climate emergency is real. And it's a problem, but less than 50% support doing anything that would affect their life to deal with it. So <laughs> we've got to get to the point where people both understand that it's an emergency and then are willing to start looking at things we can do. I've proposed already that we start requiring in 2022 that new roofs new, on new houses have to be solarized and, new, and roofs on townhouses have to be solarized. Um, that's going forward. And people who've done solar, and if you haven't done it you, and you've got a sunny roof, you might think about it. A lot of folks are saying their bills to pay for the solar are less than your utility bills. And that's a big deal. If you can get to the point when it's a net positive for you, then it makes sense to make that investment. And, you know, 20 years ago, I couldn't stand up here and tell you that, but that's the reality now. It is a worthwhile investment to make and you'll see more and more people making it. Um, we're focusing on growing the economy and we're doing some things a little bit the same and a little bit different. Um, we've got the Economic Development Corporation. We really want them to focus on what we call fishing expeditions, finding large corporations and getting them to come here and working with existing companies that are ready to expand to make sure that when they expand 
they look to expand here. So we're looking to make sure that Montgomery County is present and willing to work with people to help them stay in the county. But we've got to grow the workforce more broadly. And I'm very interested in the incubator programs. I've seen programs in Baltimore that focus on high school educated working class kids who learn skills, learn trades, and learn how to make things. Um, we've got a good bio incubator, but we need better incubators in regular small businesses. I wanna make sure that our incubators come with support staff so that entrepreneurs can, entrepreneurs can develop the skills they need because you can have a great product idea but if you don't know how to market it and you can't do a set of books, you're probably gonna fail. And there are lots of good ideas that have failed before. And you know, so it's important that if we're training entrepreneurs, we really fully train entrepreneurs to make sure that people get the skills they need to be successful. And so we're committed to growing up a, another generation of incubators. Our, like I said, our biotech incubator works pretty well. The other two incubators, not so much. And so we can do a better job. And part of doing a better job is being honest about what you're doing. And when things don't work, you've got to be willing to say, I'm not going to keep doing this. I'm going to admit that it doesn't work and I'm going to find something that does work. And that's an approach we're actually trying to bring to the entire budget is to actually start getting conscious about what kind of decisions we make and what the outcomes are. Um, we also, we started a for business campaign. I don't know if any of you went to those meetings, but uh, we, Sydney Katz and I went out. We did a tour of the county. We met with small businesses all over the county. I think it was five meetings, maybe six. Five or six, right. Okay. I've narrowed it down to those two numbers. So there were five meetings and we gave people the opportunity to come and tell us what they find problematic in dealing with the Montgomery County regulatory system, whether it's getting a building permit or getting a business permit or dealing with any members of our bureaucracy, we wanted to know what's not working so we can fix it. So we've taken notes. One of the first things we did is we shortened the contracts from contracts that were well over 100 pages to something that's between 15 and 20 pages and actually has a one page summary on the front. So you know what the terms of the contract are and what we're asking you to do. I've introduced legislation to give local businesses preference. And so when they're rated, if they bid on a contract, they get 10% bonus points for being a Montgomery County business. And we price them, you can be 10% above the low bid if you're equal in, in all other regards. So we're willing to pay a little bit more for Montgomery County businesses because that money stays here. If I give money to a Virginia company, it walks out the door, crosses the river. Maybe somebody eats lunch here if they didn't pack a lunch. But that's about the economic activity I get off the dollars I spend. If I support Montgomery County businesses, I get their property tax, I get their income tax, I get their personal property tax. Um, they do business in Montgomery County stores. Um, they're here in this community. And so I get some of that money back because of the taxes we collect and the benefit it brings Montgomery County. So we're gonna preference local small businesses and make sure they know that they're wanted here and we wanna make a better environment for them. Um, we are working with our um, WorkSource Montgomery, which is another program which has been fairly ineffective. Um, it has not created working class jobs. It did not train people who didn't have skills for work. Um, we have beaten this dead horse for a while and the council and myself have, you know, both agree that that organization needs to be reformed, restructured, and to focus on job training and skill development and also finding jobs for people who need jobs and have a resume. But that should not be the only thing they do or the major thing they do. We need to be more aggressive in terms of training the folks who need skills in Montgomery County to get those skills. There is a lot of work that is going unfilled right now because there's a mismatch between people's skill levels and the skills that jobs require. And a lot of people left high school without what they needed to learn. Uh, we have problems we know, particularly in graduating minority students from our high schools with the skills they need to be successful. We've got to re-engage those former students get them the training and the skills they need so they can get jobs in the economy. There are jobs out there. 
We're not in the pl we're not in the jobs desert. We're in a place where they actually exist. We just have to make sure that our residents get the training and skills they need to be able to take those jobs. Um, we're doing a 10 year strategic plan. So we're looking at our budget 10 years out. And that means planning for things like a recession sometime at least once in those 10 years. Uh, it's unusual to go more. Uh, we've gone probably a record length of time without a recession, but we also had a record anemic recovery where you got jobs, but you didn't get wages. And so, you know, you, you have a lot of people who are working again, but the jobs they're working at aren't the jobs that existed before. So we need to plan for the future. And, you know, what we've looked at in a preliminary way is that it seems that revenues and expenses are going to stay pretty closely related to each other. And the good news is they're going to be close to each other going forward. The bad news is if you want to do anything different, there's nothing there to do anything different with, which is why we are making a major emphasis again on looking at what we do and how we do it and ask ourselves whether we need to do everything we're doing. Is there something we could do that would meet our goals, but meet it more efficiently? Um, we need to be better stewards of the dollars that we have because no one's going to give us a pot full of money to pay for early childhood education or pay for affordable housing. So out of my $6 billion budget, more or less, and the half of it that I get to keep that doesn't go to the school system, we need to figure out how to do a better job with the resources we've been given. And I said this when I was campaigning, and it's true today. The unions in Montgomery County understand that when we run out of money, they're in the same boat everybody else is. So we've had ongoing discussions with them to work with us to resize the workforce in Montgomery County because, we, because it's not in their interest for us to run out of money and it's not in our interest to run out of money. So they're willing to work with us to help us reposition people. We've been talking about you may not always work in the same job for Montgomery County, but we can find jobs for you in Montgomery County. So as we have attrition, we've got four or 500 people who leave every year. We can move people around rather than hiring replacements for everybody. And hopefully over a period of years, reduce the workforce of what we currently do so we can hire people for the things we need to do. And my goal is to keep total employment roughly equal with some people moving around and some new positions being created, but trying to keep the total number of jobs not any more than what we have now. And that's, that's going to be a tough thing to do because we have a history of growing and growing and growing. Um, we need to be sure that as we grow, we do it in a way that it's sustainable in the future. Because any if you all have things that you want the county to do better, unless I figure out how to use this money better, it's going to be very hard to do the better things that a lot of people want. And I want them too. That's why I ran. I didn't run to preside over a steady state or a slow decline. I was looking for a way to move the county forward and do it in a way that's fiscally responsible and sustainable. Um, and the last thing is, happy day for the bond rating agencies. <laughs> we met all reserve targets. So we've put aside the amount of reserves that they expect to see. Um, so we're no longer going to be in this. Are we going to be able to make our reserves next year? Um, I, I spent 12 years on the council, and we weren't always able to fund everything we thought we were going to fund in a given year. So this, we have finally gotten more or less where we need to be. And so we can focus our energies on some other things we have to do. So that's sort of my overview of that part of the budget. Um, the next slide is outcome-based budgeting. And this is another part of what we're trying to change. Normally, the budget just repeats itself from year to year. You know, everybody, you, whatever you funded last year, you expect to get funded next year. If you're a department and you're running a program, you're running the same program next year. We're asking everybody to stop, think, is that program you're running, does that really make sense? You know, I know you're doing it, but is your, are you getting the best um, value for the dollar you're spending or are there better ways to spend that money? Is there something we could do with limited resources that would have a better impact than what we're doing today? So we're focusing on outcomes and we're gonna expect departments 
to start measuring themselves against outcomes. And again, you know, I, as a council member, it's hard not to draw on your experience, but we used to get frustrated because we didn't feel that we always knew whether what we were spending money on was working. We just spent it because people said this is good and every program had an advocate, but it didn't mean that what we were doing was actually working. And when I got in there this year and I had a whole page of things that they had no metrics for, and I knew they were all work in areas I think were important, but I couldn't tell an effective program from an ineffective program because there were no metrics by which to measure these things. And so if you're gonna have a better government and a more efficient government, you better adopt the system of metrics. And so we're adopting a system of metrics so we can begin making people accountable um, for how we do things. And I guess this is sort of like a, a good comparison of outcome-based budgeting and traditional budgeting. Um, you incrementally, traditional budgeting, you just incrementally allocate funds, make adjustments for your expected new revenues. Um, last year's budget's a starting point. Uh, departments submit a budget, which is what I wound up with in December. Departments had submitted budgets. You evaluate their submission, and then it's all pretty much based on prior spending. And it's not, it's not a formula for reflection. It's just, let's just do this thing again. And we know how to do it again, so we'll just do it again. Um, the way we're doing it now is we're looking at programs and services. If you look at the seven objectives we had, you didn't see a department mentioned in there because all these things require interdepartmental cooperation. So we're looking at if I'm gonna to try to deal with a healthier community, I've gotta look at all the departments that are gained, engaged in making a healthier community and make sure that everybody is doing the things they need to do to contribute to different outcomes. So we're trying to get departments to work together as opposed to departments being siloed from each other. And I remember that one of the shocks I had when I was on the council was we had had a fire and we were talking about we should have fire counseling services. And it was like, well, why don't we mandate? And I forget which department was. Why don't we mandate this department has fire counseling services? And then somebody said, oh, there's another department that already has fire counseling services. Um, inside the same room, not everybody knew what was being done. And we, it shouldn't be like that. So we need to make sure we understand what everybody's doing and we can fit it together better, I hope. Um, you start with outcomes as a starting point. The only reason to spend money is to try to accomplish something. So people have to be clear about what it is they want to accomplish. And so we're starting with outcomes. Uh, we're looking at budget proposals that focus around programs. And uh, we're going to evaluate program services based on the performance. And so you can go back a year later and evaluate how departments have done. And, with, and this applies to the nonprofit world as well. That, you know, nonprofits often get money and often they don't have metrics. And we give a lot of money out to a lot of different organizations. We're going to make everybody have metrics. It's the only sensible way, I think, to spend money. And so we're going to go about doing that. And we're going to continue to co cooperate both internally and externally. Um, I don't know how many of you here from nonprofits, but I'll say this even if nobody's here from a nonprofit. Montgomery County would not have the reputation it has for community service without the nonprofits in this county. We should be perfectly clear about this. If these programs that they do were in the county budget and we were paying county wages, county benefits and everything, we wouldn't do as much. And it's because dedicated people are out there and they believe in the mission of the work they do and are willing to work for an amount of pay that isn't necessarily what they would get in the private sector, but it's enough to make them happy enough to be willing to do the work they do for the reward they get. We get an enormous amount of work out of the volunteer community. The value they produce for us is enormous. So a lot of times when people thank me for something, you know, I may have written a check that helps fund part of it, but the reality is if it weren't for the volunteers out there doing this work, a lot of this would never happen. So I'm gonna end my part here, <clears throat> just on the budgeting process, you all know what we're doing. So this fall, all the departments are gonna review 
on their performance data. They're going to come up with budget proposals in the winter. Um, myself and my staff will evaluate the proposals. And come March, we have to send something over to the council. And in late spring, the end of May, this will be done. I'm hopeful this year will not be like last year. When I came in on my second day, I was told I had to cut $50 million out of the budget. Um, which was known about for a lot longer than the day before the second day, um, which meant I had fewer months to make those cuts. Uh, three weeks later, the capital budget is separate. It's a thing that builds things and it's separate than the operating. This was the off year where you move a couple of million dollars from a project that's, you know, saving money and you put the couple million dollars in a project that's overspending. A couple of million dollars turned out to be a hundred million dollars in programs out of $300 million that I had to reorient in order to make the budget work. So that's not what I was looking forward to. And then right before we submitted the budget, the state said you had to write down revenues for this year by, was it this year was seven? 70 and next year was? This split between the two, yeah. Roughly $80 million between two years. And that was right before we were ready to send the budget over. So that went more cuts. So this was not the most fun budget experience in the world. Um, it is hard cutting when you know that what you want to do is to spend money on people, things that people want. It's not the dollars, but it's the programs. And so anything we cut means less library hours or, you know, services for senior citizens that we wind up not providing. And uh, there's nobody who wants to do that. None of the stuff we do, I think, is extravagant or unnecessary. It all builds a better community and gives everybody a chance to find a place in Montgomery County. So I'm optimistic that this year will not be as uh, difficult as last year was. So with that, I will turn it back over to Corey. He will continue. Then we'll do questions afterwards. Thank you. Next little segment here is the fiscal update. The county takes very seriously its responsibility to be fiscally sustainable. And while we're required by law to have a balanced budget, we've actively made the choice to have an aggressive reserve target policy. We also believe very strongly that our employees deserve good benefits in retirement. And we've taken steps to have well-managed retirement obligations. You heard the executive mention the 10-year strategic plan and the outcomes-based budgeting, but those are all qualities of being fiscally responsible. Now we get to the graphs. These are the charts here. Uh, where does the money come from? You'll see three big pies here, property tax, income tax, and the intergovernmental slot. This is where state revenues and federal revenues come from. The next slide is where this money goes. And as was mentioned, half of it goes to MCPS. The bulk of the rest of it goes to public safety and HHS. Another way to look at this information is on the next slide as the percent of the commitments of the general fund Large portion there is the requirements of MOE, the schools and college contributions. And then there's a requirement for debt service and pay go, which is related to the capital budgeting. And then we've made commitments on our retiree healthcare or retiree pensions and the contributions to reserves, which leaves 26% for the rest of the budget. All of the decisions have to be made in that 26% block. Next, we look at the progress that has been made on those reserves. Uh, in the depths of the recession, a decision was made that we needed to build back up. And the target was set to be at 10% by fiscal year 20, and the fiscal year 20 budget met that commitment. Process of building to the 21 budget starts with determining what the revenue estimates are going to be. That's numbers we're going to get in November. Realistically, the next option is the enrollment forecast for schools. This will determine how much money above and beyond we, what we've already committed we have to adjust for for the schools. Um, the contributions for schools are based on enrollment, and changes to the forecast for those can have a big impact. As you see, half of the budget is for the schools. Next, we have to consider the changes for employee salaries and benefits, for the retiree benefits, and any changes to debt service and capital contributions. After that, there are considerations made for any new laws that take effect. And only after all those are considered do we get to figure out what's left for the things we want to do. 
The next slide talks about the different opportunities that you all have for community participation. There's participation in the budget forums like this. There's uh, service, service on boards, committees, and commissions. You can submit letters and emails to the executive. And then when we get closer to the council approval of the budget, there are public hearings to be held on the budget. The next slide is a shameless plug for OMB and the website, Montgomery County MD.gov slash open budget. We have both operating and capital budgets on this. The operating budget is new and improved and has a lot of detailed information about all of the information that's contained within the budget. And then the capital budget is one of the things that has, it has maps. There are maps that display where all of the projects in the county are and it's very interactive and any place you want to look to see where they are, it's in that little corner there, but there are different projects and you can figure out where the work is being done in the county on the budgets. And with that, I will turn it back over to the county executive. Thank you. I was just playing with my calculator. Um, so if the school system is above Last year's enrollment by 1,700 times 15,000 a child. That automatically adds $25 million to the school budget. That's just the starting point, which is a little over one cent on the tax rate. Unless other revenues come in, I mean, you don't have to resort to the tax rate. Just to give you a perspective on how that affects us. And then there's, of course, inflation, which is the other multiplier. And... I'm not even including that because that's a big number too. So questions, anybody? Uh, all righty, so this is where we started with uh, questions, comments to for the county executive. And since we're running this live TV, the way we generally do is we go row by row all the way to the back of the room and we try to get everybody. Anybody on the first row? All right, we'll start with you, Lewis. We'll walk our way back, you can stand up. Say your name, part of the county you reside, and I always hold the microphone. <laughs> Hi, my name is Louis Mazzano, and I live in the Aspen Hill area. Um, understanding that the Montgomery County schools rank really well nationally, <clears throat> wouldn't encouraging alternative like Montessori private charter schools help decrease the dependence on the county budget for K through 12 education? Depend how much it costs me to encourage Montessori and all the other private schools. Um, it's all dollars and cents, and if I have to pay private schools to hire teachers and pay the rent and everything else, I'm not likely to win in that proposition. Um, so that, it's not clear to me that that's the best use of public funds. And it would take money out of the classrooms. Anybody else on the front row? Okay. Don't worry, I'll get to you. Hello, Bill Jellen from the uh, Wheaton Urban District Advisory <coughs> Committee. Um, I'm here really as, as a representative of that committee. Um, we're excited that you're here. I appreciate your pragmatic approach to this budget. Um, but I wanted to kind of underline a few local, local issues that we'll be giving to you in more detail through a letter. Um, but for, for the community members that are here, um, you know, we're really excited about this plaza that is being built um, and soon to be finished. Um, but, we, but we also want to underline that to make that kind of the, the beating heart of Wheaton that we hope it will be uh, for all these people that, that currently live here and we're hoping to attract back to our urban district and make this one of the most unique and successful urban districts in the county. Um, you know, we're gonna need some investment of, of staffing, um, ways to make the, the you know, events, to make the, the plaza and stuff lively and used, utilized. Um, so I so wanted to underline that we see some needs there um, that may be in addition to the current staffing that we have. We really only have one dedicated staff member uh, to the Wheaton Urban District, to the marketing, the advertising, you know, everything else gets kind of, um, you know, partitioned out. And, um, you know, the, it's, there's great people working there, but we do see a need for more, especially to um, utilize the arts and entertainment designation that we have locally. There's so much potential there that we really think that this is kind of the time to, uh, to jump on. So I just wanted to, to underline that and look forward to giving more detail to you in, in the future. But if you have any thoughts in particular on that, uh, we'd love to hear it. So um, 
Conceptually, I don't disagree with you. I thought, you know, in the recession, we cut the regional services centers down to one person. They used to have a staff that was much more engaged in the community, and all that was casualties of the recession. And so I'm not averse to adding people back in. I'm very interested in activating parks in general. You know, we're talking about a, a big park in Bethesda on this series of parking lots that I think is going to be paid for um, as part of the deal to have another a building built there. Uh, not on all of it, but on part of it. And uh, so I, th I think there's a real value in this. I'm actually interested in the thoughts on closing the front of the Reedy from Friday after rush hour until Monday morning at rush hour. I've got to talk to my transportation people. They want to close. They said they prefer it for specific events. I'd like to turn that space into a weekend. This is a community space. So it doesn't have to be a specific event. It can be people going down there and deciding they want to hang out and play guitar or, you know, picnic or just, you know, hang, hang out with their friends. And so I'm going to talk with our transportation people about really examining, can we just make the decision to close it at eight on Friday night and reopen it at six o'clock on, or maybe midnight on Sunday night. So, you, so you're prepared for it being a road the next day. But I would like to try to activate that space more regularly. And I've talked a little bit with arts people about thinking about the bigger community parks and thinking about what you can do with them. Because I know there, I've talked with people who would like to perform in the parts, parks. So Wheaton, we know, is going to have a stage with lighting and speakers. So the thing is to make sure that thing actually works and gets programmed. No point in building that if it doesn't get programmed. So I, I do agree we should do some work to make sure there's we do our part in programming as well as providing a good place for people to hang out. Oh, and I just have a second part. Sorry. I don't think you need the mic. But. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay, I'll talk. In, do you mind if I stand up? I feel very awkward like that. Um, <laughs> so going along with a beating heart analogy of our plaza, um, we need to, as a resident that lives, you know, a couple blocks from here, uh, we need to attract people to this plaza, to this place, and to our businesses. Um, and so we need those arteries. We need those connectors. And, um, you know, Wheaton actually had a fully funded sidewalk improvement plan 10 years ago. Um, and, and it's just been kind of been putting Band-Aids on it since then. And, you know, I mean, you were there at our walk, you know, in May. Mm -hmm. um, we'd really like to see some dedicated funding to pedestrian improvements in Wheaton. I mean, people... It's very dangerous. Uh, there's not enough mid-block mid legal crossings. Um, we need to make this a true urban destination and district by allowing pedestrians, bicyclists, all man <clears throat> manners of transportation to, to come in and help this community thrive. So we're going to be asking the, the zero, um, what do we call zero, the vision zero. We're going to be asking them to come up with a some recommendations that we can start implementing. We're not going to implement everything at once because the price tag would be enormous, but there are th things we need in Bethesda. There are things we need in Silver Spring. Silver Spring just got the, the first protected intersection. Uh, so there are some things we need to do and spread around the county, and Wheaton's included in that. Okay, another question over here. Sorry, if you would stand up, please. Thank you. My name is Mensa Joga. I'm the vice chair of Mid County City Advisory Board. I have a question for you uh, concerning uh, the MPDU, affordable housing. What specific plan you have to help the developer to increase the MPDUs? What type of incentive Look, you have? I think when when we take two-story buildings and upzone them for 15, 20-story buildings. I've just given them the incentive to providing more affordable housing. Um, we need to require it. And we need to require housing that's not just 60 to 80% of market. We need to get a broader mix of housing, which is what I'm hoping to see in the proposals that we get back. It's what we've asked people to think about as providing housing in the lower prices and getting us a mix of housing so that we can afford to house more people than we can currently today. Thank you. Any questions on this? 
You're good? All right. Second row. Second row. Well, we'll work all the way to the back. Ma'am, if you would stand up. Sure. Good evening. My name is Susan Rich, and I live in Wheaton in the Connecticut Avenue Estates neighborhood. I wanted to mention two specific issues to our neighborhood and then one more general. Um, we have a huge, pro it's a very dense neighborhood with uh, over 1,000, 1,200 semi-detached homes. And there's a huge parking problem in the neighborhood, which leads to a lot of tension in the neighborhood, uh, people reserving parking spaces, et cetera. Now, of course, we have houses that are occupied by two and three families, and that is part of the affordable housing issue. At one time, the county offered a low-cost uh, driveway program to allow people to put driveways in. And I think it was in conjunction with the state at the time. They were doing a lot of rehab in the neighborhood. But we'd like to see that uh, resurrected in the neighborhood to get some of these cars off the street and stop some of these neighborhood fights that are going on over parking we'll spaces. Make, we'll make a note of looking, see what the state has. That would be great. Uh, number two, uh, we have, uh, it's a lower to middle income neighborhood. We have many people that walk long distances to get to public transportation. And for some years now, some of us have been pushing to get the ride on routes extended more into the neighborhood to allow people to get up to the hub at Connecticut and Veers Mill Road. Slowly ride on has added little uh, extensions, uh, actually going to the other end of the neighborhood and uh, uh, for some reason, there never seems to be money to extend it into the heart of the neighborhood. Uh, people trudge long distances. These are people that work the office cleaning jobs at night. It's a heavily Hispanic neighborhood, and we would really like to see some attention given to these folks. For some reason, they're able to extend the route uh, onto Kensington Parkway, where there are million-dollar homes, and here in this very, you know, lower to middle-income neighborhood where these people really depend on public transportation, we've been trying to get some help, and that would require some money in the budget at this point, I'm guessing. We'll try to, well, yeah, well. And, and then the more general issue that is raised by things I've seen in the neighborhood is, you know, I, one of my concerns is animal protection. Uh, we have a huge problem in the county with pet overpopulation. And I see a lot of it in this neighborhood, litters of puppies and kittens that are uncared for. Now, I brought this up at one of your listening sessions, uh, Executive Elrich. By law, the county is supposed to, quote, directly or by contract, must establish one or more clinics where county residents may have dogs or cats altered in a humane manner by a licensed veterinarian. In 2014, the, the county set up a $21 million animal shelter with a huge surgical suite. And at this point, there is one and one half veterinarians working at the shelter. Yet, when I run across a situation, for example, of someone who had 12 pit bull puppies, four of whom died, and I tried to get the woman assistance by getting her hooked up with a low cost spay neuter program, and even went to the director of animal control asking for some help. Nothing was available, nothing was offered. The closest sort of affordable program is in Laurel in Prince George's County, which to me, suggesting that to someone for whom spaying and neutering is a low priority is like offering them trip to the moon. It's required by law. The space is there, the surgical suite is there. It's not a matter of building a clinic. It's a matter of directing animal services to use their resources for the purpose for which it was supposed to be established. And this plays into your larger issue. You've talked about reorganizing the department. And I know that's a bigger issue, but this is very concrete with the overpopulation of pets. So I'd like you to look into that. And if it requires an additional vet or a half-time vet or something, we're the only county in this area that does not have a low cost, affordable spay neuter program. Okay. You got that down? Yeah. All okay. right. This side? Yeah. Cool. No? Okay. Your turn. Please stand. <laughs> hey, I'm speaking for the senior citizens. I noticed the budget, you mentioned the youth and the families for the, uh, for the people that are over 60. I rely quite a bit on the senior centers and the recreation centers. I've been going there for over 19 years. It's done me the world of good. 
I've gotten a lot out of it, very worthwhile. The new budget came in, cut and slashed so many of our things. Uh, I go to Longwood, I'm from Romney, my name is Evelyn Schwartz, and I'm really advocate for all these services that were removed. I also go to Holiday Park, which is a huge center. 300 to 500 people go there. And the budget was cut so that the custodian that used to move the furniture for us is no longer there. And we, 60, 70, 80, and 90 year old people are moving the furniture. And we can't, we really shouldn't wait till the next year. This is a dangerous situation. If one of us gets hurt, some of the people here are the ones moving the furniture, including me. Some of those tables are very heavy. If we fall, the county's going to get sued. And I'll, I mean I'll, look at, I'll look at the custodial situation. This is very dangerous. In the short term. But and I'm we thinking, shouldn't wait till June or July. Like I said, I'll look at it in the short okay, term. Okay, I appreciate it. And look at the bigger issues about staffing. All right, we have another question on the side. Do you have an answer? Let me get to you, sir. Oh, what's your answer? Thank you. I'm Alan yeah, Frazier. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on. Hold on just a second. He's hold got on. an answer. I have an answer for you. Rich Madalino, I'm the Director of Office and Management and Budget. Um, you may not like the answer. It was not a budget cut. Um, when the, when the um, contract for the custodial services for the senior centers was relet, um, it turns out that the previous contractor, unbeknownst to us, was providing services that were not in the contract. They were doing those services out of the goodness of their heart. And because it's not in that contract, the new contractor is saying, that's not the contract I signed with the county to provide these services. We are looking at a solution to how to, to, how to do that. So I just wanted to make sure this was not an action by the county executive or the county council to cut. It was a contracting issue that we are working to solve as quickly as possible. Okay, Thank you. sir. My name is Alan Frazier, and I'm also a volunteer at the Holiday Park Senior Center. But I want to speak to uh, about the, those people that are in their 80s and 90s. We have a lot, of, I guess the women outnumber us at the Senior Center, by three to one or something like that. And these are the ladies are moving some of this furniture around. The furniture, the chairs there, are a lot heavier than these, and they're on carpet. We did have a lady fall about a month ago, and, and when somebody falls, they have to call uh, rescue squad, and they have to you know, evaluate whether they're okay or not. That's the, the problem that we see there. We only have one custodian now that is going around, and she cleans the, the bathrooms all the day long, and she's just going around from one bathroom to the other. So this is possibly a hazard, either you know, with infections, falls, and other things. So that's what we need to have something done. There. And I think that we also, one of these uh, forums that you have should be done at Leisure World, where you have, I think, 8,000 people. And you could get, because a lot of 80s and 90s and those in the 100s do not come out at night to these types of forums. And maybe you get some more input from those people. Hey, you're setting Dude, up. You're setting, we're setting that up. All right. We have another question, comment on this side. My Which, name is Ray Green. I live in Bethesda. I have a house there that I'm replacing the front stairs. And uh, I got into looking at uh, cement production. It turns out that uh, you can't uh, deliver cement only a limited distance because it hardens. So they have plants on South Lawn Drive and uh, you know near Goody Drive and stuff you know, to produce cement. I found out that cement production causes greenhouse or releases greenhouse gases. Now, it seems like, you know, you, you, I don't know what the solution is. It's like a catch-22 situation where it's you know, hard to uh, move cement plants away from uh, you know, the place where it's needed. So. Uh, how would you handle a situation like that? Um, I got to say, this is one of those things that's that we're seriously going to have to think about how we do things, because no one's going to build. The, actually, there was a cement plant 
in Bethesda, but when people decided it didn't fit with the ambiance, the, <laughs> the cement plant left, and so you're left with South Lawn Drive. Um, no one's going to build, no one's going to buy real estate in Bethesda and build another cement plant. Um, you could probably get some people to come out with a portable cement mixer. I've done this myself and uh, toss 60, 80 pound bags of cement into it and get one that's motorized, not by hand. Um, and you can get people to do it that way. I don't have a good solution to rebuild, you know, rebuild your steps in wood. But, but, but I've, I, look, I've seen people actually do that. It took down the cement. We're not going to go through the expense of having somebody form another set of steps in cement. And they, then they built their steps out of wood. It works. There are plenty of wooden porches out there. It's not an ideal answer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. You do, ma'am? Okay, please stand. I'm Anna Jacobs. I live on Gold Mine Road and spent... 11 months in agony driving all through the United States of Albany and Ashton because we had to make so many detours. Well, the pain was worth it because you did a beautiful job on that bridge and, and Thank you. the road right after the bridge. Why was not the road continued on up to, to New Hampshire Avenue? and a little further up Gold Mine Road. If the road is terrible, once you get over the bridge and go up a little bit, it's not extended. I have people coming in from out of town, company from all over the United States coming in, and they say, my God, your roads here are like a third world country all over Montgomery County. The minute you get into Howard County, you know you're in Howard County because you're off of these roads. It looks like what Montgomery County does is they repair roads, but they don't do a good job of it. It's not smooth, it doesn't hold up. Something's gotta be done with our roads. So I will say we're looking at another reconstruction technique rather than what we've been doing. Um, we're gonna try what's being done in some of the counties around us where they go through and they, they scrape up the asphalt and then actually reprocess it and then lay it back down with one truck doing one drive through, um, which they say is less expensive than what we're doing. So we're going to see whether it is. Um, I got to say, you know, our roads are way behind. When, when I got elected, he put in a major increase in road repairs. And even that isn't enough to deal with the cycle, we are in a cycle of more than 50 years. If we fix something, more than 50 years before we revisit it, and it's just too long. But we've got to find ways to free up more capital so we can do more roads so that the cycle between repairs isn't as long as it is. But what they're trying to do now is identify things that are pre-failure before the water has gotten down to the concrete you know, because if you if you got a crack in the tar, that's one thing. If the water gets through the tar into the concrete underneath it, when it expands, it blows up the concrete. And then instead of a resurfacing, you're into a reconstruction. So I was told their priority right now is identifying those roads they can save before they become reconstruction projects. And that's their immediate task for right now. But we're going to look to see how much money we can find to put back into this. Did you say you had a follow-up? Yeah, I, ha I have one other thing. You were talking about Montgomery County is going to be, um, it's going to be mandated that they have to, we're, uh, if you build a new property, you have to put solar on it. What happens with the roof? The roofing company today will not want solar panels on your roof. If you have an extending roof and you decide to put solar panel on, you vo void and null your, your warranty on your roof. Um, I've talked to people who've done it, and that's not anything anybody's raised with me. But when this is done with new construction, it's going to be different than going on to an existing roof and an existing substrate where no one's going to warranty the plywood underneath the roof. If it's new, it's going to be built to a standard that you don't have to worry about whether or not it can hold it. Well, the way I understand it, any little thing that happens, any kind of little leak, it's all on the homeowner. 
And I built I, my you're own the first home, person but this was, told me. this was 35 years ago when I built the house, so there was, there was never a problem. But I would hate to have to build a house today knowing that I've got to put solar panels. I would move out of Montgomery County first. You might actually save money by doing it. Well, you, you might, you might, you might. That has not really been proven yet because you've got to live there a long, long time to recoup what it costs to not, put it on there. Not really anymore. I know people who, who pay in less than their electric bills from day one. No, I realize so, that. I realize so, you will you will on a monthly basis you will save, but to recoup what the solar costs. No, that is to recoup. If it's taking the payments for a solar and comparing it to your utility bill, the solar payment is lower than your utility bill. So you're paying a bill you weren't paying before, but you're also not paying a bill or as much of a bill as you were paying before. It actually works out. All right. Questions on the side over here? Okay. Yes, sir? Good evening. My name is George McFarland, and I'm very much into health and wellness. And I want to first applaud the administration on building this beautiful complex. And I think as you travel around the county, you find excellent recreational centers, uh, libraries. And, and my interest is in having these facilities utilized more as a way of promoting health and wellness, particularly for the aging community, but all of our communities. When you travel around this particular facility, when I look at all the rooms that we can use to promote healthy, health nutrition, diabetes management, cardiovascular health, there's a walking track just outside this, this door. I think we have to find a way to bring the people out of their homes and bring them into these facilities and utilize these facilities. You have a big kitchen right next to us where people could begin to show people how to prepare food that is more nutritious, that will allow them to live longer and healthier. And so I, I hope that the, that the county will continue to utilize these, these resources better. And I am very interested in use, utilizing them. Thank you. We built these to get used, so please use them. You do have a question now? Sorry, I'm not. Thank you. Hi, I'm Betty Bahadori, and um, I work a block from here in our family business, and I live in the Holiday Park community. And like many people in this room, I wear multiple hats, and I have a couple of questions. I am on the Montgomery County Justice and Advocacy Council for the Archdiocese of Washington, and we're watching very closely what the county council is proposing in bills um, regarding housing for low-income people. And we want to make sure that there is teeth in any bill, for example, the air conditioning bill, or to reimburse when you get um, displaced because the place is no longer habitable, and um, that you have staff that are exactly targeted to maintain and to you know come in and actually enforce these bills that they're proposing. I'm also a member of the um, Montgomery County Autism Society. I have a son that's 32 and an adult with autism, and um, here I come, the DD budget, the supplement is so important to us. I know that you've looked at it to make sure that it was utilized as it should be, and I'm glad you did that. It's appropriate, but um, we are depending on that. To think that the state is gonna change to relieve Montgomery County of that burden is not wise. We find that um, they're not giving us the rate studies that we need, they're changing the wa waivers, and there's a lot of you know concern and we want to make sure that direct caregivers earn more than minimum wage because it's a very difficult job. It's hard to attract and retain caregivers. Right. So on, on the first thing, we're, we've trained our housing staff, retrained them from where they were under the previous situation. Um, they did a good job, I think, going out there um, with that first round of inspections, and I think they feel unconstrained they can actually go out and inspect the building and no one's gonna yell at them for inspecting the building. 
Um, so I think things are going to be better in that regard. Um, I, I think we're going to get some good news on the disability front. I know people are pessimistic, and if, as long as the disability community has waited for anything sensible, I know it's been a long time, but we think at least on some of the funding, we're going to be in a better situation. Um, I have worked with some folks to put together a meeting. You know, we were going to do a general public meeting. We decided, everybody decided we would smart, start with a group of advocates and some parents and our legislators. We would then meet with the state people who run the programs who I don't think really understand some of the changes they're trying to put in it. They don't know what it's going to do to, to caregivers. And so I'm playing an active role in trying to put people together to make sure we have those conversations so that our legislators are more effective at advocating for us in Annapolis. And if I have time for one more point, you know, you talked about how you're going to change up the contracts to try to keep in Montgomery County. I would love to see Montgomery County itself and these contracts have a percentage of people with disabilities built into that, that we are, you know, as a goal or a requirement. We have some goals in county contracts. Um, the state's making some interesting moves. I'm not sure they're not going to backfire which really worries me because if they get rid of supported employment and assume that everybody's gonna be able to go out and get a job, I've got a disabled son, there is no chance in the world he works without support. So we need to try to get them to think a little bit more correctly about this. Thank you, and we all thank you for having this earlier in the budget year. Thank you. All right, ma'am, do you have a question? Okay, this row over here, you, okay. Oh, you're fine, anybody? Whoa. No, no, say it's not true, Dick. <laughs> yeah. This side over here, any questions? All righty, I'll come to you, ma'am. I hold this thing. Come over this way. It's that way that camera gets you. Right here. That's good enough. Thanks. I hold it. Okay. Uh, my name's Arlene Rosenbush. I live in Aspen Hill, and I want to thank you for doing such a terrific job. I like all your goals. Um, I'm just a citizen representing... Uh, myself, um, I swim at the Alney Indoor Swim Center almost every day. I've been doing this for more than 20 years, and they do a fantastic job on a very little budget. It really needs a major overhaul. Um, I see a lot of seniors there. We go there. It's not a luxury. It's a necessity. We all go there for our aches and pains. There's nothing like the pool to it's therapy for us. Uh, we do it because we have to. And it's very used by um, children learning less, learning how to swim, swim teams, uh, generate money for them. They, they are a money maker. But the pool has not been, keeping, been able to keep up because they don't have the money to do it. And um, it needs a serious overhaul. And um, it's really even hard to keep the water at consistent temperature, <clears throat> the locker room, the showers, everything, the saunas. It really is hard. Um, uh, we see the changes uh, from all the use it's had. Um, I have one more um, comment to make. I'm also concerned about bicycle safety in the county, and I would like to see more um, efforts made to keep the roads safe for bicyclists, especially when they're building or changing the roads to make sure that there are safe places for bicyclists to, to use it. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, Anybody? Want just one minute. Um, in the back, Lisa Mandel Trump and Joy Nurmi, Lisa from Sydney Katz's office, Joy from Gabe's office, and over there, Evan Glass, and Andrew Klein from my office. <laughs> All right, any more questions on the chart? Alcar was here, yes. You're next. Your face is familiar. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, Jim Epstein, as you know, I wear many different hats. Um, none tonight. Uh, none tonight, that's correct. Uh, and you know it's got to be important to be here because uh, the Nats are playing, so. You I know. know. Um, you probably have it on your phone then. I think it's two to one, yeah. Right <laughs> maybe, maybe one to one. Anyway, I want to, um, in wearing the WUDAC hat, uh, Wheaton Urban District Advisory Committee, I want to follow up on some of the comments that Bill had, and I don't want to get down into the weeds, we'll do that in a letter, but I want to reiterate a couple of things. Um, 
we appreciate the revitalization of what's happened in Wheaton. You were at the forum last year. You know that the community wants more, et cetera. Let's talk specifically about uh, the needs that are coming up that are one-time needs and then ongoing needs, specifically as related to the urban district and the management of two new facilities that are now under their responsibility or will be once this new building and transfer, transfer occurs. And that's both Veterans Urban Park and also the urban park will be transferring to the urban district, uh, Veterans Park, as well as the new Marion Fryer Town Plaza, uh, which is an amenity that the, the county negotiated through with the developer. But I want to uh, mention a couple of things and maybe correct some misunderstanding. I know you've mentioned, um, it's really close, thank you. I know that you've mentioned uh, that there's lighting and sound there. I don't believe that's accurate. I believe there's up lighting for the little um, scrim that's there as the cover, but there is no lighting or sound. There's no uh, portable Marley floor for the dance companies, et cetera. No, I didn't say there was gonna be a portable Marley floor. I realize <laughs> that. So the point being that um, if the county is providing a facility that's to be utilized, uh, not just by the urban district, but there's also coordination with parks, planning, rec, cup, et cetera, that will be utilizing that facility as well. Um, there have to be resources to make it a workable, activated facility, uh, a central area of the community, rather than, than just a glorified pass-through to the metro. Um, so that requires some upfront money that you will be added into our request for the first year of this two-year budget cycle that you're implementing, because we need to buy additional equipment both to physically maintain the facility, to keep it clean, and hopefully to add some infrastructure like lighting and sound and things along that line. Because the, so the alternative to that has been that when the county, any agency, utilizes a facility and they ask a third party to then rent sound and equipment, and so we can use a lot of different examples, you know, the the uh, Friday night concerts, we hire a sound company every year. Well, okay, that's in, a, in, a, in Veterans Park, but we're spending way much more money on that kind of a, an expenditure rather than a one-time, let's build some infrastructure for lighting and sound and storage, et cetera. So that's one side, and that also fits into your more effective, sustainable governing. Uh, secondly, we need ongoing, um, one-time and then ongoing resources to supplement the one person that we currently have that does all this programming that needs to coordinate with the other agencies that will be using it, let alone the third parties, to be able to manage it, to be able to activate the A&E district, to execute the events, et cetera. And so however it's done, whether it's through an FTE, whether it's done through consulting, uh, whatever games have to be done, I think the bottom line is, or not games, but manipulation has to be done. The bottom line is those resources need to be allocated. There are not a lot of in resources for initial costs, but then it's the ongoing cost that needs to occur, however the county finds a way to do that. And I think that's the point that we want to get across so, to. Uh, on the stage and lighting, I was told I was getting stage and lighting. It's not accurate that I'm aware of and we can have well, that conversation. Separately. Well, I don't, I will have with the person who told me because yeah. they're managing the project. Yes. Yeah, well, <laughs> so I'll find out well, where my stage and lighting are. Yeah, the only lighting we know is some um, decorative up lighting for the scrim. That's the scene. That's the, the, the roof. That's mm, it. That's, that's not what, what I was told. So, okay. Let me follow. Anyway, but the other there. thing is, I mean, I will go to every regional service center area and everybody's going to tell me we need to restore people to the regional service centers. So that, and that's my problem because it's not just Wheaton. However, it is a common problem that, that none of us in these communities have the resources that used to be there. So we are gonna try to, in the search for, you know, I need to find things I don't need to do and jobs I don't need to do. And so I can put people into jobs I want people to do. And that's part of our job over the next you know, four or five months is making these kind of changes and identifying if this is a priority, how do I fund this and what else can I live without? Well, we understand that. And I guess our only point is, yes, there's a need in every regional service center. However, the county has now placed two new properties on the uh, of management, activation, et cetera, 
programming um, to the already overburdened workload. And one person or one and a half people don't have the capability to do that, let alone you also refer to Bethesda and Silver Spring, which are the other two more active A&E districts, and we're really only an A&E district in name, and we need to activate that, let alone if we're coming down to a cultural center in a couple of years, et cetera. So that's a separate issue, maybe a third party, 501c3 or whatever, but these are things that Wheaton needs in order to complete this first step of revitalization. We are looking at the POR on, on yeah. the, the other facility that right. people want. Right. And my interest is, you know, seeing if we can find somebody to put that on the backside of park and planning and then build housing above it, and which we reduce our cost of getting the facility. Okay. Support that completely. at the same completely. time, get some housing over there. So Actually, we'll we also that. suggest an incubator space on top of that. And so we can talk about that separately. Yes, we but. can. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. You, ma'am, please stand up. Hi, I'm Teresa Jones from Forest Glen, north of the Beltway. I've got a couple of questions. Um, one big concern, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. One big concern that we have is the uh, so-called tunnel underpass that is going to be dug, going from the east side of Georgia Avenue over to the west, but there will be no access from the west side to the east, and. Um, we are wondering if you and the council can, uh, th the last plans we, we saw, okay, um, can find a better way, uh, find a better way for the county's resources. Um, we understand that, yes, that is a heavily trafficked intersection, and it is precarious going across Georgia Avenue and getting over to the Forest Glen Metro Station. However, there's got to be some other way that we can do this so that everybody has access. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, well, I'm as, to... as of right now, as of right now, the plan is that it will go from east to west, but there will be no access on the west side for that same tunnel. Um, is it not possible to do something well, like they've I'm done? I'm confused. How do you not? If, if well, the we're confused. Opening we're confused. on both ends. Yes. Uh, okay, the, the tunnel, from from what we understood, is that the tunnel would um, have access to the turnstiles, go over to the turnstiles from the east side to the west, but there would be no way to get down to it other than going all the way around through the parking lot for, on the west side. So there, there are a lot of but couldn't questions. you walk down to the turnstiles and then go through the tunnel the other You would way? have to go across and down or down... Um, you would have to go down into the parking lot. I, so, I can look at the design, yeah. but I can't picture. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's confusing to all of us also. But the other thing. A tunnel. Well, um, yeah, and, and that's the other. Is there no other way? Is there no other way for um, this? Um, could there not be a bridge that's built across a la Rockville? Is, is that, I mean, I've talked to people who said that that could be a, a viable solution also that doesn't impede the flow of traffic going up and down Georgia Avenue. But, um, I mean, if you think about the topography over there, you don't have a good landing spot for a bridge. If I, if I cross over from the west side, which is the Walter Reed side, for those of you who don't know, right, yeah. to the yeah. east side, you're immediately going downhill to Holy Cross Hospital. So I don't know how you get a bridge to come across and be 15 or whatever it is in the air and then not only descend the street level, which has to be. So you're saying slope. that the, the so basically what you're saying is the only way to to deal I with this issue is. I think the shortest is path is on the ground. Underground. Okay. But you can you know we can look at the design and see if there's any anything that would make it more accessible to other people. Okay. But do, but don't you get into the metro from the north? No, we cross west corner. Um, what you do is, for those of us on the west side, it's at, at right now, or we, we either cross over to Forest, the other side of Forest Glen and go down a set of stairs, which there's no ADA compliant entrance to that metro, by the way. Um, or then you walk all the way down and you can go through the parking lot and then there's a, a ramp 
basically. Um, and so we understand the need. We understand the need because I've tried crossing the street and there are people on the west side that, that get the bus going, you know, heading north. But there's, there just seems to be, there's got to be a better way. We can look at it since obviously it's not under construction. Right. And, <laughs> and we're is, still and, looking for state aid. So. Okay. All right. So that that's good to know because we also wondered where the county was with this. Um, so, so the good news on that is that um, it is now considered shovel ready, mm -hmm. which it wasn't when we asked the state to submit it to the federal government for funding. So the state actually told us it's shovel ready, so it's not like they were hiding it from us. So we can now ask the state to put it back in the package that's federal funding for, because they would only fund projects that were considered shovel ready okay. or shovel ready. Um, secondly, about that walkway, who would maintain it? I've, we've heard also that WMATA isn't real happy about it, and, and um, but you know, like if we're going to build it, somebody's going to have to maintain it with us. Well, okay, so that's I the question force, I'm asking. So I can't force WMATA to do it. Right. So, so the, the, the county is, has to do it. If they're not willing to take it on, then we're going to have to take it on. I mean, there are only two people who can right, do it yeah. unless you got a third volunteer out there. No, we don't. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's good news. And uh, finally, um, there are many people in the Forest Glen area that would like you to come to our neighborhood and have one of these wonderful open forums as well, because we've got a lot of questions. And uh, I can come to your neighborhood in that forum. I've, you know, I've used years ago um, something at Holy Cross, which had a really large right. room they let us use. So you could work with my staff and arrange we'll that. We'll be happy to. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks. Okay. And thanks for Thank you. All right. Any questions on the side over here? You do, ma'am? All right. Let me go ahead and if you walk this way, because camera is over here. All right. Hi, my name is Karen Maryshow. I am in my workout attire because I am a resident in the area. I also am from Forest Glen or Forest Estates. Um, I wanted to thank you for... Uh, mm -hmm. Funding this magnificent building, I think it has a lot of potential to engage community residents. Uh, there's a couple of things that I'd like to address. As a resident, um, I also have concerns about Georgia Avenue and the crossover towards Forest Glen uh, Metro Station. Um, also have some concerns about ADA compliance and accessibility in our neighborhood. We have a number of aging neighbors um, who are already struggling to cross the street safely on time, as well as make it down the stairs to the metro. So that is something that I uh, think is a dire need for the county, particularly for our area to address. Um, that's one thing. Uh, I also am a commissioner for the Commission on Aging and Honestly, I, I'm not sure how to start this, but why aren't seniors on the county executive's priority outcomes? Because I guess I tried not to name everybody. I spoke generally about youth and families and a greener county and easier commutes and safe neighborhoods and affordable and welcoming and all those things include everybody. Well, not particularly and, because well, you you do you do name youth and families. I mean that's very specific, and you did mention that fifty percent of the budget is going towards youth. So that's very that's specific. My, that's my non-choice budget, but yeah, no, I I that's hear. That's only to just absolve myself. I of hear what you're spending. saying. I also heard you talk about ROI from the point of time in which you uh, intercept and engage youth with education. Well, there is an ROI for seniors. And so the ROI for seniors is different. And the way that looks, of course, is reducing costs for medical care. It's also reducing costs for uh, other things that may occur as people uh, age out, um, they're trying to remain in their homes. That means that they need some support. That means that if they're going to stay stimulated, they are going to need to be able to go somewhere and have some kinds of socialization. One of the things that HHS 
for um, uh, the Department of Aging and Disabilities is proposing is a Senior PLUS program. The Senior PLUS program is used at two of the centers. If you all are not familiar with it, it is a program that helps seniors that are starting to have some cognitive decline. They are in the beginning stages. And so for them, it is very important for them to remain socially engaged and stimulated for as long as possible because there is a cost, of course, when one has to move from their home to a group home or to an assisted living facility. So that is an intervention that has financial repercussions if it's not addressed sooner than later. Transportation is an issue for seniors. Housing is an issue for seniors. Food is an issue for seniors. When seniors are going to these senior centers, they're able to get food. And so if the senior center's hours or days of operation are being cut, that means that that has an impact on food for seniors for those days that the senior centers are not open. So all of this is related. As seniors age out, they may or may not have family members that are able to help them with making physical and healthcare decisions. That then falls on HHS, uh, Department of, Disabil of Seniors and Disabilities, for their guardianship program. The guardianship program, I'm sure uh, you are, may be aware of, but if you are not, are overstrapped. There are, I believe, two individuals that are handing a caseload, and there are uh, over a thousand individuals, I believe, that are in need of case management and guardianship. Uh, so there are a number of issues that need to be addressed, and there is an ROI issue, because if they no are not addressed sooner than later, there are going to be costs to the county. Uh, one of the other things that I wanted to mention is uh, as it relates to uh, seniors in their home. Seniors in their home, in order to remain in their home, they need to adapt the space, a lot of them, and how they're able to do, you know, get about and do their day-to-day -day activities. It may be steps leading up to their homes that they're no longer able to climb. It may be steps within their house that they're not able to climb. It may be the width of their hallways or their bathrooms and those kinds of things. Uh, there are some opportunities for some seniors, for those that can afford to pay some money towards uh, fixes to get a loan, I believe through the state and sure. get some credits, but not everyone is able to qualify. Not everyone has that money up front to be able to make those accommodations to their homes. So that is something, if a senior is not able to stay in their home, they're falling down, they're having issues, there's hospitalization costs, you know, everything is interconnected. So what I would like to see is I would like to see seniors to be added as a county executive priority to this list and the budget. And I would like for you to give serious consideration to the ROI that is involved if you choose not to make that decision. So I'll tell you some of the stuff we're working on. One is we've got a program, it's, it's an experiment to see about matching seniors up with other seniors so that people who are living alone, if they want a roommate, trying to find some another senior who might be living alone and want to have a roommate so that we can actually put people together in houses. We will continue to work on expanding a program that helps people do repairs. Uh, we got approached by the state. They've got a program they've implemented in a number of other counties. Montgomery County is not one of them but it's a program that helps seniors get access to home repairs, which is a big deal because mm -hmm. if you get up, I mean, I would change a light bulb standing on a chair that's a folding a chair. Now, that may be not the best thing to do, but for a senior who takes a fall, the fall can have, you know, life-altering consequences. Right. So the program they have, we're actually asked, we've asked HHS to look at mm -hmm and to evaluate in the context of the villages, because the villages perform some of these services, mm -hmm. villages don't perform the same services across all villages. Right. So we need to figure out, is there a way to integrate these two things together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it offers a more complete set of assistance to people to help them stay in their homes. The cheapest thing for a senior to do, mm -hmm. if done correctly, mm -hmm. is to stay in a home, to sell right. your house 
and then get into an expensive apartment or try to buy a condo, which would eat up everything you got for your house and then settle you with a mortgage is not a good solution for mm -hmm. people. So we're going to try to prioritize keeping people in their houses. We've introduced a new bus service. It's in two places right now, mm -hmm. but it's called the Flex. It allows That's people to call and get a bus, pick them up and say it's a scheduled pickup right. in case you don't know about it. And with at the block intersection closest to you, which we think will help seniors um, do some of these mobility trips because mm -hmm. if it's in a two mile radius around the metros right now, two of the metros right now, it could get somebody to the library, to a senior center, mm -hmm. and to anything else that falls inside those circles. So I'm interested in expanding as much as we can possibly do. I worked with the SIT state when I was a council member to bring in the program that helps seniors do repairs because, again, here was the program the state had. To have your attention, please, the Wheaton Library is closing in 15 minutes at 9 o'clock. Public computers will shut down automatically in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We're your work at this time. That's abrupt. All right, so, that sums it up. <laughs> so, look, I would like to meet with you all. You all should be on my calendar to meet anyway and to get a list of things that we should look at incorporating into the budget. Okay. I would like to tell you that I have a solution to this, if you would like to hear it. I propose that because you're putting so much money into youth and their families, that there be a partnering between youth and seniors. So when I worked for the city of Tacoma Park as a program manager of their lifelong Tacoma program, I also collaborated with an organization um, of uh, youth volunteers. It was called the Difference Makers. And basically the way that it worked is that the seniors were paired with youth that helped them do minor repairs in the house, change light bulbs, things of that nature. They did uh, an energy audit in working with the city of Tacoma Park. Um, and they were able to advise seniors on small changes that they could make in their home to help slightly reduce their utility bills. The um, difference makers also shoveled the sidewalks and uh, the pathways and the cars for seniors so they could get in and out of their homes when it would snow, to go to the pharmacy, to visit with family, to go to church, what have you. If you're putting so much money into youth and families, I think that it would be good to marry the two with seniors so that there are some supports because one relies on the other. Does that program still exist? In I believe it does. And one last thing, well, two more things, What's but I'll try to round get, it up. Did you get the name? We've got to close. Okay. The, the, um, now, don't quote me unless you're going to have to Google it because I'm not 100% sure of this. So fact checkers, you can go on Google. But I believe that it's by 2034, the number of seniors are going to outnumber the number of kids from 1 to 18 years old. There is a senior tsunami. So we have to be prepared. And your budget needs to reflect those changes in demographics of ages of residents in Montgomery County. So that's what I wanna leave you with. The other thing is, one final thing, for climate change, you were saying you don't know how you're gonna tackle that, you've got some plans and how to get people engaged and how to have them make changes. I also work as an engagement strategist for the Audubon Naturalist Society, and we have been working diligently on engaging people in Montgomery County and teaching them about the necessity of climate change and what personal changes they can make on a small level that will make a difference. So, so partnering Audubon, with nonprofit yeah. organizations is another way that you can tackle climate change. So your Audubon group might want to work with a group that comes out of this doing public outreach so that we're all okay. spreading same message, same information. Right. And there's lots of other nonprofits that are doing that work you could partner with yeah. as well. Okay. All right. I think uh, we don't have any more questions or time for them. One Just 30 sec. 30 sec. Come on. One question in 15 parts. Um, yeah. No. Uh, Mark, so I think the move to uh, define specific metrics uh, across the different departments and everything is great. Are you going to publish metrics, those metrics and uh, status on them year over year? Like dashboard type stuff, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's easy question. I know because yeah, otherwise know. I will I will tell you I'm successful every year. <laughs> All right, you have 15 seconds, ma'am. 
only because Director Riley said you could, and she needs to close the shop. <laughs> yes, all right, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm the president of the Commission for Women, and as you know, we advise the county council and the <clears throat> county uh, executive, uh, you, your office, um, on issues concerning women. So one of the things I wanted to do, um, I wanted to request is that as we are working towards a revitalization um, efforts around the county, ensuring that uh, women and women-owned businesses are considered and perhaps given priority, um, it, or in the contracting efforts, um, ensuring that women are represented in the hiring and also in the procurement efforts. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about also is um, uh, as we move forward uh, following the outcome-based uh, budgeting model, um, the Commission for Women, uh, the history of the Commission for Women has, we used to have our own facilities and a, a large budget, and we have, you know, had to reduce that based uh, because of the budgeting constraints. But we still offer some programming um, in the county. So do you have suggestions? And I would like for you also to consider to make sure that uh, the Commission for Women is uh, considered as you move forward with your budget. Um, but also, do you have some suggestions for how we can, on a, con on a constrained budget, continue to offer programming to the community? Well, however constrained it is, it has to provide enough money to offer programming. <laughs> so, I mean, it's going to be constrained, but we should be funding some things. We've been funding programs. So I don't anticipate that we're not going to fund programs. So. Is, is still yeah. represented and at yeah, the top of your priority it, list because we do focus on yeah. uh, a, a lot of your priorities and, and our current priorities yeah. are aligned with yours as well. So, so and we've had some good discussions about this. So the thing about the other question about um, not about well about um, employment or um, business opportunities, one of the things we're looking at is we've got general goals for minority and women disabled businesses and things, but. On the small business set aside, the small business set aside did not come with um, minority women goals. And so we're looking at including minority women goals in the small business set aside so people get access to those opportunities if you fall under it as a small business. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Mr. County Executive Elrich, would you have some uh, <laughs> very short closing remarks? You got 15 seconds, sir. That's really short, yeah. So I really like these things. I mean, I got in the habit of doing listening sessions and budget sessions last year. I think the two totaled 13. Um, so we're starting out on the same path again. We're going to do the budget sessions, and then we're going to go count around the county doing listening sessions. And listening sessions are different than budget sessions because budget sessions, I'm asking you to focus on the budget. When we do lessening sessions, we're going to have a broader discussion and people are free to talk about anything. I, I actually enjoy this interaction with people. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Good evening. And for you at home, do know that the county executive will be hosting an additional four forums. The next one will be on Monday, October 21st at the Chevy Chase, Bethesda Chevy Chase Regional Services Center. For more information, visit the county's website at montgomerycountymd.gov. I'm Lorna Virgili, and thank you for watching.